what do you do if you run into a text and simply cannot figure out what it means? That's what I face here. And so the point of this session of Look at the Book is, what do you do? What does John Piper do when he's perplexed about the meaning of a text? So here we are at 3, 18 to 20, and there are a couple of verses here that I'm simply not sure what they mean. In fact, I'm not alone in that because um, here's a text uh, from Martin Luther where he says about this text, uh, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for a certainty just what Peter means. So Martin Luther takes this text and he says, I'm baffled. So am I. So here's, here's what I do. I try to step back from all the uncertainties and I ask, what is clear here? Does the author at least tip me off what main aspect of this text he's going to work with, and can I draw good, solid truth for life from that? So, Father, I pray now, as we look at this text, that you would bring clarity, perhaps even where I haven't seen it yet, uh, for those who are listening and watching, and that you'll show us what to do when our own limited perspective, our finiteness, or our sinfulness gets in the way and keeps us from understanding the fullness of your word. So this is 1 Peter 3.18. We've already looked at this verse, but let's read it for for context. Uh, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which, that is, in that Spirit, in which, He went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Several questions. In this spirit in which he was raised, he went and proclaimed, but it doesn't tell us what he proclaimed. And so there's a question we need to answer if we're going to understand it fully. What did he proclaim? And he proclaimed to spirits in prison, which raises the question, um, are these human spirits Or angelic spirits? Are they angels who were disobeying during the days of Noah and were thrown into prison? Or are they the humans who were disobedient during the days of Noah and now have been thrown into the prisons of Sheol and hell? And if they are human, is this preaching taking place during the present time of of the uh, of Noah so that he pr- proclaimed to the spirits then in those persons and then they were disobedient and later were thrown into prison so that the preaching the proclamation took place during the days of Noah or is the preaching taking place in the prison now, perhaps between the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ? Those are some of the questions that need to be answered. So let me, let me show you three views. Here's the way Tom Schreiner, in his good commentary, which I recommend, sums up these three views. And let's just take them one at a time. And I'll, I'll tell you right now that Dr. Schreiner tends to prefer number three. And I have tended to lean towards number one, although I don't have any very strong conviction about it. So number one is uh, this preaching to the spirits refers to Christ's preaching through Noah to those who lived while Noah was building the ark. 
For example, it says back in chapter 1, verse 10 to 11, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them, in the, in the prophets, was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. So here, here's a, a clear example in the book of Peter that Christ in his spirit was back there speaking through the prophets, one of which was Noah, to the people and indicating uh, the things that were to come. So that may be what is meant here when it says, uh, in the Spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits who are now in prison because they refused to obey the preaching. That's the view that I have tended to lean toward. Here's a second view. It refers to Old Testament saints who died, even though they were disobedient in some measure, and were liberated by Christ between his death and resurrection. And here's a text that is sometimes used to connect with that. Ephesians 4, 8, and 9. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. And so, that interpretation would say that Christ did this proclamation to the spirits who are now in prison because Christ went to the prison in the spirit between Good Friday and Easter and he preached a, a message of gospel and those saints who had been in some measure disobedient there believed and confirmed that they were actually saints and were uh, taken as liberated captives into heaven rather than being left there in the darkness of Sheol. Or, or a form of this would be to say that he, he preached to those unbelievers in uh, prison and confirmed that they would stay there. The, the last view that uh, Tom Schreiner and, and many others are these, these days are, are embracing, the text describes Christ's proclamation of victory and judgment over evil angels. And a very important parallel is two verses later, in verse 22, it says, He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been subjected to him. And this uh, subjection of angels and authorities and powers is related back here to this proclamation to the spirits, meaning angelic spirits, not human spirits, who are in prison because those angelic beings, perhaps like the sons of God, if that's what it refers to in Genesis 6, were disobedient in the days of Noah and were thus put in prison. And now uh, Christ in the spirit, in the resurrection, is proclaiming his victory over those spirits. So those are the three views. Now, what do we do? Because frankly, as I ponder each of those views, I see advantages to them and I see disadvantages to them. And I, it's very hard to weigh which one is the most compelling one. And what I do is I step back and I say, what does Peter want to get a hold of here mainly? And I notice in the next unit, right after verse 20, I read this. Baptism, which corresponds to this, that is, the rescue of a few persons through water, now saves you. So, if you go back here, it says, Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. And then right here, there seems to be a shift in focus. While the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water, and then he goes on to say, baptism corresponds to this. So what, what Peter is picking up on is the safe passage of a few believing people through water, which is a kind of type or foreshadowing of 
baptism. Well, if that's what he mainly picks up on, how should we step back then from, from all of this and say, well, what can we really be confident about here? And it seems to me that what we can be confident about is that he has in view a few faithful persons, eight in particular, Noah and his family, and they were brought safely through water in spite of judgment that was looming. And I think, don't you, that this comes to Peter's mind because the church in that day felt so embattled and so small in the Roman Empire. And over in chapter 4, it says, chapter four seventeen, time for judgment. It is time for judgment, just like the, the flood the time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome? In other words, this rain, this judgment, (laughs) R-A-I-N, this rain is going to fall on everybody. And, And what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God, which it says those people didn't back in those days, Noah's day. They didn't obey the gospel of God. And if the righteous, these few, is scarcely saved by getting into an ark just in time, what will become of the ungodly and sinner? So this is the day of Peter being spoken about here. The the Christians feel that they're in that day. And so back in chapter 3, verse 20, when it says, a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, I think he means for the church to take heart God can save his people no matter how massive the judgment that is coming upon them, no matter how massive the opposition seems to be from these disobedient people here. He can save his people in the most stunning ways, and we are to take heart no matter how great the opposition or great the judgment.